Yeah, the principle is this. If God condemns it, I am not celebrating it. Mm. That should be the standard. Mm -hmm. God condemns it, we are not going to celebrate it. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 166 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And in this episode, we will be discussing Alistair Begg and the advice he gave to a broken-hearted grandma concerning LGBTQIA unions and dealing with sin. Hi, this is Jay. MCG and I would like for you to help us remove barriers by going to removingbarriers.net and subscribing to receive all things Removing Barriers. If you'd like to take your efforts a bit further and help us keep the mics on, consider donating at removingbarriers.net slash donate. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. All right, Jay, let's start with the background of this incident. It has been way back in January, I think, but tell us the details. Alistair Begg is a Scottish pastor. He is the senior pastor of Parkside Church in Cleveland, Ohio. And he recently came under immense fire for something that he revealed in a radio interview in, I'd say it was Thanksgiving, Christmas time in 2023. He only mentioned it during that time. Internet caught wind of it, and it's just become a whirlwind of a controversy. It's a controversy because Alistair Begg is not known as a pastor who teaches falsehood. He's not one of those health, wealth, and prosperity preachers by any measure. He is a very solid preacher. The controversy was that he was counseling a grandmother who had a grandchild that was a part of the LGBTQIA community. And she was struggling with how to show this grandchild the love of Christ while calling out their sin and drawing them or pointing them to Christ. This grandchild was in the process of getting so-called married. I say so-called because we know that's not what real marriage is. And the child wanted the grandmother to attend the so-called wedding. Well, the grandmother was conflicted about this, went to Alistair Begg for counsel, and he counseled that she not only go, but take a gift to present to them as well in order to show them the love of Christ and open up more doors, create more opportunities to share the gospel with them. This was done in private counsel. It's only during this radio interview that he revealed it in fall or winter of 2023. And then it became a controversy early this year. I want to say it was back in February or so, late January, February, where everyone caught wind of what happened and there was instant and swift backlash. Again, because Alistair Begg is not known as a false teacher or a heretic, he's known as a very solid and very capable Bible teacher. Everyone was surprised by the advice that he gave. And in response to the criticism, he doubled down and did not recant, did not try to explain, and simply he doubled down on his position. And that's what got everyone up in a tizzy, if you would, about the situation. Yeah. I think we heard about it, at least I heard about it back in late January, sometime in January 2024, about this situation. And I think at times as Christians that we use the words of the world so often, or we allow the world to take over words that they should not be able to take over. So I think it comes down to at this point is... I guess a question that other minds should be, what are the weddings that Christians should and should not attend? And before I even dive into that question, I think we need to define what's a wedding and what's a marriage. Yeah. I think if you look up in any dictionary, a wedding is a celebration of a marriage. That's very important. Definition is very important. It's a celebration of a marriage. Of course, there's other definition. You can say it's a union of two persons. You might see stuff like that. But for the most part, when you think of a wedding, you think about a celebration. What would you say to someone that says a wedding is the ceremony of a marriage? 
like there's the ceremony part that everyone goes to yeah. and, you know, the bride walks down the aisle, all that. And then afterward in the reception, that's the celebration. I what think the entire to... thing is a celebration okay. of the marriage. Now, for me, as a Christian and as someone who believes the Bible is inerrant and infallible and all the other big words that we like to use, final authority concerning everything regarding life and death, I think a marriage is a covenant to God between a man and woman to become one flesh. So a wedding is a celebration of that covenant to God between a man and woman becoming one flesh. Now we can check Malachi chapter 2 verse 14 where I'm referring to wedding as a covenant. Keep those definitions in mind because I'm going off of my definitions. LGBTQIA cannot be in a marriage. They're in a governmental union. And it is not a wedding. It is a celebration of governmental union. I think we need to take back those words because many times I think marriage and stuff like that, uh, for lack of a better terminology, are quite honestly religious terms. I don't think the government should be involved in marriage at all. Marriage existed before the government. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 24, the Bible says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And he brought her unto the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That was even before government was instituted. So therefore God instituted marriage. God gets to define marriage. As the land of squires will say, there Creator is the definer, or the, actually he said the designer is the definer. God designed it, God gets to define it. So I think as Christians, thinking biblically, what is a marriage, what is a wedding, and going back to Genesis saying that marriage was instituted before God, I must say that, you know, just to lay the foundation, as I said before, I personally think the government should stay out of marriage. But the question kind of beg, and I'm going to go round about here, but I'm bringing it home. Should you need the government? for you to say, hey, yes, this person is married. When you and I got married, we had to sign papers and we had to, whatever the case may be, to the government of Florida to let them know, hey, yes, we are married. You have to get some kind of permission from them and then we sign it and send it back in and stuff like that. And now they declare us married. So the government, a marriage is a contract. And you can prove that because we didn't get pre-marriage counseling in Florida. And because we didn't get pre-marriage counseling in Florida, we had to read the Florida Handbook on Marriage or whatever they call it. I don't remember the name of it. But I remember it clearly because I was wondering. The first couple of pages were about marriage, congratulations, whatever the case may be. And the rest of the booklet was what would happen if you got a divorce. Hmm. And if you got a divorce and children involved and all this stuff. It's a contract. Yeah. The government don't see marriage as a covenant that you're making before God. To this one person, it's a contract to the government. But to God, marriage is a covenant. So when is someone married? When do you become husband and wife? Is it when you sign the paper and turn it into the government? Is it when you go before God and make that covenant to what the case may be? Should the government be involved? Of course, the Bible says in Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever there shall resist the power, resisted the audience of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So the Bible here tells us, hey, submit yourself to governmental powers, as long as they don't ask you to violate the scriptures. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17, all of all men love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So therefore, the Bible tells us here, hey, obey the government, you know, as long as the government is not asking to violate the word of God. And we have examples in scripture of marriage. We talk about Adam and Eve. God was the one who literally brought them together and declared them husband and wife. We have examples in Genesis where we see Abraham send his servant out to find a wife for his son. So we have examples of celebration. One of Jesus' first miracles was at a wedding when he turned the water into wine. So we see that short scripture that we have marriage being performed. We see celebration. And then we also see that, hey, we have governmental at least now in our day, we have government powers that say, hey, all these things to be declared marriage. For me, I think the best way to bring it home is to say this. 
I believe that you're married when a man and a woman made a covenant to God and before witnesses that they, hey, we are becoming one flesh. And I also think that it's okay to sign the governmental papers because they're not acting to violate the word of God. However, if you live in a culture, and there are cultures around the world, that the government are not involved in marriage. Or you might live, like for instance, in 2009, I had the privilege of visiting the Kamiya people. These people live in huts, they wear grass skirts, and the government has no record of them. They don't go to the government to be married. And yet among them, they know who's married and who's not. Exactly. Like okay. So I do believe that there's some culture that involves in marriage. I do believe that the government can be involved, even though I don't think they should be. And also, I think the most important part is that covenant you make in before God to each other to become one flesh. So I say all that to say this, hey, LGBT, quote unquote, wedding, quote unquote, marriage. It's not a marriage. It's not a wedding. Because a wedding is a celebration of a marriage and LGBTQIA, if you're married to someone of the same sex, it's not a marriage. That's not my opinion. That's scripture. So going back to the question. What kind of marriage should we be allowed to attend in this case where, as Christians, where we should allow to attend? Obviously, if there's two persons of the same sex getting married, quote unquote, I don't think we as Christian, Bible-believing Christian, should go or to take a gift because it's not a marriage, it's a slap in the face of God. If someone who professed to be a Christian and someone who is unsaved or a Christian and unsaved, the Bible says, hey, no, they should not be getting married. I don't think as Christian we should be attending that wedding neither. Anyways, I have more, but I'll let you jump in. <laughs> I agree with you that there is a stripping and a cheapening of the definition of marriage in our culture today, so much so that not even the church at large is able to defend it. That may be why so many churches are willing to cede ground till the LGBTQIA mafia on this particular subject. They may be thinking, well, what's the harm in allowing these people to be, quote unquote, married? We want to be accepting. We want to be tolerant. We want to show them the love of Christ. If we tell them that this is unbiblical and that this is sin, they won't let us talk to them. So why not see this little piece of ground? But the Bible describes sin. I believe it's in the book of Proverbs that there are certain things that are never, never, never satisfied. Uh, the barren womb, for example, and it goes through all these different things. Sin is very similar in the sense that when you cede to it or when you yield to it, it's never enough. It wants more of you, more and more and more until you're enslaved to it or until it completely consumes you. Our pastor always says that the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. And that means that when he gets a hold of you, he'll completely shred you until there's no semblance of whatever was there. He'll completely shred and destroy it. Sin will do that. And so when we fail to understand that marriage is something that God initiated, God instituted, and God set the definitions and parameters for, when we forget all those things, then it's easy for us to look at any other type of union and say, well, well, why not? It's not hurting anyone and we want to be loving. Why not? So when it comes to unions that the Bible makes clear that are acceptable, I don't think the Bible is silent on this. Male and female created he them. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, not father and father, not mother and mother. Man will leave his father and his mother and will cleave to his wife, not husband, not wife and wife, a husband and a wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So I think the church needs to be unapologetically, I hate to use this word, but I'm thinking of it in the context of others making fun of us for standing firm. We need to be prudish on this particular issue. This is not something that we should cede any ground to secularism or any LGBTQIA mafia, because when you attack the institution of marriage, you're attacking not just marriage, you're attacking families, you're attacking children, but you are also attacking God's. The Bible says that marriage is a picture of the relationship that Christ has with his bride. Yep. And so you're assaulting the very reason Christ came to die for us, salvation. 
and what that looks like to be in right standing with Almighty God. Sometimes when we talk to people at the door, or particularly this is common with children, they will say, well, why am I responsible for Adam's sin? I wasn't in the garden. I didn't eat the fruit. Why are we all sinners because of Adam's sin? When they ask that question, they don't understand the federal headship that Adam has had as the progenitor of the human race in the same way that those that are born again through faith in Christ now have the second Adam, have Christ as their head. And what that actually means, it's not my place to teach, but this is what I'm trying to convey is that this is so much more than just a guy and a girl liking each other and making a promise before God and getting married and have raising kids. It's so much deeper than that. And so if we waffle on these things, if we're not steadfast, if we are afraid to stand on the word of God when it comes to those things, what else is there to fight for? All of what God is trying to talk to the human race about, it can be encapsulated in this institution that we call marriage. And so if we're talking about two unsaved people, male and female, that's perfectly fine because male and female created he them. There is a common grace for people to be married, even if they're not Bible-believing Christians, even if they're not following Jesus Christ. But where a Christian should absolutely put their foot down is any type of marriage that has any and I put marriage in quotation, any kind of union between any member of the LGBTQIA community, any union where an unsaved person is marrying a saved person, because that's expressly forbidden in scripture as well. Those are not weddings that Christians should partake in because of the assault that union is on the picture of salvation, the picture of Christ with his bride, the church. Yeah, the principle is this. If God condemns it, I am not celebrating it. Mm. That should be the standard. Mm -hmm. God condemns it. We are not going to celebrate it. So you're talking about a safe person, unsafe person, as I mentioned before, light and darkness. Bible make it clear that that does not mix. They don't go together. They should not be getting married. You should not be attending that wedding. I think that should be the case. And even to bring this home, we had a similar situation like that in our family where we had one person professing to be saved and married to another person of the opposite sex that clearly wasn't saved. And there was a little bit of a riff because one side of the family believed that the person who said that they were saved, that they're not saved. And one person said, hey, this person professed to be saved, and this person is married to someone who clearly is not saved. I'm not going to the wedding. But that person didn't go to the wedding. Yeah. And I can't fault them because one person claimed to be saved and clearly was married one person who wasn't saved. Mm -hmm. The rest of the family said, hey, this is two unsaved people getting married. This person who claimed to be saved is not saved and is marrying someone else who is not saved. So it's two unsaved people getting married. That's a kind of little bit different situation. You kind of follow your conscience there. Do you believe the person is saved? Well, no, I'm going to the wedding. I believe that they made a confession, not a confession. They made a profession Mm -hmm. and clearly married someone who is not saved. I'm not going fine. I think there's room to follow your conscience there because there's a situation where you come down to, do you believe one person saved, one person not saved or whatever the case may be. But if you clearly know that there's one person who is saved, married another person not saved, they think the Bible says, hey, they don't mix. But here's the difference between this though and the LGBTQIA so-called quote-unquote wedding. When an unsafe person married an unsafe person, the sin is disobedience. They're disobeying God's word. But once they get married, the disobedience is no more. The Bible does not say, okay, if you're saved and you married an unsafe person, you should immediately get a divorce. No, the Bible never says that. You're saying like if a saved and unsafe person get married, the disobedience is in the getting married. But once that happens, it's no more. Okay, I'm trying to. Right. So once they get married, the disobedience is no more. They're not living in sin. For an LGBTQIA, not only is the union disobedience, Their lifestyle is disobedient to God. Mm -hmm. So the sin continues. Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between, hey, I'm saved. I'm going to marry an unsafe person. And they finally get married, even though I don't think Christians should attend that when they get married. Then you say, hey, oh, well, they already made their bed. I'm not going to encourage divorce because God hates divorce. But the sin ends there. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us how a saved spouse, in terms of the wife, 
should handle an unsaved husband. I think that is in First Peter. First or second Peter, I don't remember it clearly, but the Bible does tell us how the wife should win her unsaved husband, and it's not through divorce. And I think the same principle applies if the man is saved and the woman is unsaved. Yeah. So you don't get a divorce because you married an unsaved person. The sin is the disobedience to God's word of marrying the person in the first place. But after they got married, the sin is over. So there's a big difference. Also, I think, again, remember the principle, if God condemns it, we don't celebrate it. Mm-hmm. If an adult is marrying a child, I know I'm getting into some deep waters here because, mm-hmm. you know, what determines a child? Like, I'm from the islands. At 16, you're considered, for most part, an adult. In the U.S., you're considered an adult at 18. Well, let me phrase that. At 16 is the age of consent. In the U.S., for most part, for most states, I think it is 18. And we know back in the day, Mary was about 16, they said. So culture and all kind of stuff kind of come into play culture here. Culture has an influence there, yeah. But... There's an age that we clearly know that someone is a child. Sure. So even a grown man is married at an eight-year-old, certainly you're not going to go to that wedding. So Muhammad that, marrying a nine-year-old, that would probably... That's abuse. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that's happening in places around the world. Yeah. I think in the U.S., there's some states, if you get parents that consent, you can marry even at 16. Someone would argue that's a child. I wouldn't want my 16-year-old daughter getting married or even my 18-year-old daughter getting married. But that's a different topic. But a marriage between an adult and a child is definitely a no-no because I don't think the Bible encouraged that. I think the Bible condemns that. So the last one I want to bring up is divorce and remarry. Again, this could be an entire episode on itself. Mm -hmm. But to some extent, I would say follow your conscience in this one. If you say, you know, some people claim, hey, Jesus made it clear. If it's for the cause of fornication, then you can divorce and marry someone else. If you hold to that belief, and that's simplistic, I'm putting it. If you hold to that belief and your spouse cheated on you and you decided that you're going to divorce your spouse and remarry and you're comfortable that, you can follow your conscience to that. If you hold to the fact that you should not be allowed to remarry if you're divorced or whatever the case may be, follow your conscience on that one. I think biblical scholars disagree on the divorce and marriage stuff, and that's a broad topic. Sure. And of course, again, I also have to mention polygamy. You know, if the person that already married to someone else mm-hmm. should be attending another wedding for them to take on a second wife or a second husband or whatever the case may be, I think the Bible condemns that as well. So, again, if God condemns it, I am not going to celebrate it. I think that's the overarching principle. I think, again, talking about principles, the Bible talking about in First Thessalonians 5 verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. And that is very, very important because if you go to... One of these weddings, especially then talking about LGBTQIA weddings, I think is a poor reflection to your testimony of Jesus Christ. I put it at the same light as going to a bar or a nightclub. Who knows? You might go to the bar just to get a drink of water. You might go to the nightclub because you're lost and you need help, direction, or whatever the case may be. There could be legitimate reasons, but if someone sees you and know, hey, that person claimed Christ, that could be a poor testament. And again, you might make the argument, hey, in the U.S., that is not so much a big deal. I'm from the islands where everybody literally know everybody else. If you don't believe me, ask my mom. My mom probably know everybody on the island for some reason. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. Growing up in the islands, you'll go to church with a person on Sunday, Sunday night, Monday morning, you're taking the bus, going to your work or to school or wherever. You see someone else from your church. You're walking down the street, you see someone else from your church. You go to the store, you see someone else from the church or multiple people from the church or multiple people that know you, know where you live, know your lifestyle. In the U.S., it's a little bit different. It's big, especially if you live in the big cities and stuff like that. It's big. It's unusual for me to go to Walmart or anywhere and run into a fellow member of my church. Yeah, it happens, but it's not very common. It's very rare. Mm -hmm. In the islands, at least where I grew up, everywhere you go, you turn. Is someone you know, someone you go to church with, or someone who knows they profess Christ. So I guess the argument can say, hey, no one is going to see me, so what? But God will. Yeah. And God knows. Yeah. Anyways. So Alistair Begg told the grandmother to go to the wedding and not just go, but take a gift. And the reason is to demonstrate to that erring grandchild that even though you do not agree with their lifestyle, you don't hate them. You'll prove them wrong because his uh, reasoning was that in the LGBTQ mind, they see Christians and say, oh, these people are hateful. They hate me. They hate 
everything that I stand for, my lifestyle and everything. And he said, if you bring a gift, then you will cause the person to reevaluate what they think of you as a Christian and realize, oh, these people are not hateful. They don't hate me. They even gave me a gift. How wonderful. And perhaps that would open more doors for pointing that person to Christ or influencing that person for Christ. So was Alistair Begg's advice to that grandmother wrong, in your opinion? Yes, it was wrong. And it's not just my opinion. I think scripture is on my side on this one. And it's wrong because of the principles we just talked about. If God condemns it, we do not celebrate it. The appearance principle, the principle of abstain from all appearance of evil. I can talk about the conformity principle. I be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think also the stumbling block principle in Romans 14, verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or a cage to fall in his brother's way. I think that by you going to a LGBTQI, you could be putting a stumbling block before your brother, because if they know you go and they look up to you or whatever the case may be, and they're struggling with that, then they too know, oh, well, brother such and such went to that wedding, I guess the lifestyle is wrong. Maybe you're going just to, hey, show your love, but you condemn the lifestyle. But brother Tim over here doesn't know that. Then brother Tim says, oh, well, this person is conforming to the ways of the world over here. They don't know that. So how many people are you going to explain it to? I think it violates the principles that we outlined earlier. And also, it's very important. I think it's because, and you mentioned this earlier, it is what marriage symbolizes. Marriage is a powerful symbol of a man and woman becoming one flesh. And it demonstrates an example of Christ's love for his church. It's Vision 5, 21 to 32. It's very long, but I'm going to read it. Submit yourself one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. The world doesn't want to hear that anymore. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know what? I'm going to be biased here, but the command to the husband compared to the command to the wife is so weak. The wives just have to submit. <laughs> The Bible said, husband, love your wives, then just love them, you know, even as Christ loved the church and uh, gave himself for it. That's why you're the federal head, man. That's a high calling. <laughs> and the feminists of today, I know this is a bit off topic, but the feminists of today, oh, submit, submit. Hey, love your wives, even as Christ of the church. Tell me which one is harder. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought a man to love his wife as his own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall join unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she, oh, reverence her husband. Mm -hmm. So here, LGBTQ and all on an biblical quote-unquote marriage makes a royal mockery of this symbolism that I just read from Ephesians chapter 5. A big mockery. And that alone is blasphemous. When you go to a quote-unquote LGBTQIA wedding that's making a mockery of God, and you are there, when you go into that wedding, so-called wedding, so-called celebration, you are saying, hey, Christ and the church can be whatever we conjure up in our minds. So you can be a man and a man, you can be a woman and a woman, or whatever the case may be. We are making a mockery of symbolism because marriage is not a governmental institution, it's a God institution, as I explained earlier. That's what make it wrong. And that's what make what he gave to the grandmother wrong because it's a mockery to God. Of course, think about Second Timothy 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it wrong again? Because in my opinion, we refuse to suffer the consequences of following Christ. Now I understand what I'm going to say is very, very hard. Very, very hard to say. 
And I understand this grandma love her grandchild. But at the end of the day, the Bible says in Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 27, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doeth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Christ's words, not mine. Your love to the Lord, this is what the verse is saying. Your love for the Lord, when compared to that of your family, should appear like hatred for your family because you love Christ so. Again, I understand that it's hard, but when you compare your love for Christ, for God, and you compare it to your love for your family, love for that sweet child, your wife, your husband, it should appear as hatred when compared to God. Before the Beckham said it, and he hit the nail on the head when he said that, hey, they're giving us prosperity. They give us, he said, the devil give us all these things. But the one thing that he took away from us, at least in the West, is persecution. We refuse to go through anything for the sake of Christ. Yes, would it be hard for this grandma to maybe even lose communication with their grandchild for a season? Would it be hard if the grandchild become angry with her and, oh, you didn't come to my wedding, blah, 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 stuff like that? That might be just be a cause of following Christ. And keeping saying, hey, I'm not going to go to some place that's going to make a mockery of what Christ declared to be a symbol of Christ and the church. Here is Vody Buckham talking about something similar. Some of you have lost friendships for the sake of the gospel. People whom you've loved dearly. Some of you are alienated from family members for the sake of the gospel. And this is so common now. A number of people in this room, a member of your family comes out not only as gay, but then they're going to have a gay wedding and they invite everybody in the family to the gay wedding. And when you get an invitation to a gay wedding, that's not just an invitation. It is a theological test. And other members of the family who go to church and identify themselves as Christian, they gladly go to the wedding and then here you are, the lone holdout. And you're alienated because all these other folks were good, loving Christians, but you're a legalistic monster. And now there's alienation and loss of relationship within your family because of this. What is it that enables us to continue to hold to the truth of the gospel in the midst of that kind of loss and pain? It is the presence and power of God himself in our lives. And nothing else. And I'll just say this. I'll shoot it back over to you, Jay. Jesus said unto him in Matthew 22, 37, 38, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. Hey, I understand. I hope I never have to make a decision like this grandma have to make. I hope it never come to my doorstep where I have to contemplate whether or not I'm going to go to the wedding of one of my grandkids because they're marrying, quote unquote, someone of the same sex or whatever the case may be. I understand it's hard, but the question is, what are you willing to give up for the cause of Christ? Yes. You and I differed when we were talking about this in preparation for the podcast. You and I differed quite a bit in the sense that your position hasn't changed It's the same now as it was when we were discussing this. And before, I thought, well, the only scenario in which it would be acceptable for a Christian to go to an LGBTQIA wedding, so-called wedding, I should say, is if they go there with the express intent and purpose to openly and publicly rebuke and call out what's happening and call both the participants and the attendees to repentance. So that means in the ceremony, when they say, is there anyone that feels that these two should not be married? Speak now, forever hold your peace. That's where the Christian would stand up and say, no, you should not be married. And this is why. And I thought, okay, this is the only scenario in which it would be even remotely okay to attend an LGBTQIA union. And I've been thinking about it. And I realize now that that wouldn't be the best way to do things. Number one, what I'm about to say is in addition to everything you just said, Romans 12, 18 calls us to live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 18 says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, 
live peaceably with all men. Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. So I'm watching, let me just give a little anecdotal story to prove or to explain what I'm about to say. I'm watching the drama develop between members of the royal family, particularly with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle having left the way they did, the drama between them and how the media picks up on who's attending what and who's talking to who. And so in this particular scenario, if Prince Harry doesn't attend a particular event or doesn't meet up with his father when he's in the UK, people notice it and they say, oh, because he didn't meet with his father or because they didn't go to this event or they didn't go to that gathering. There must be something there. It actually says something when your presence is not there, when you don't attend. And so when it comes to the whole LGBTQIA union, I'll, I'll kind of tie the bow here and say that if you do not attend, the lack of your presence speaks volumes. Everyone will understand what that means when you don't attend the ceremony. And at the same time, you'll have avoided all of the obvious drama that comes with publicly standing up and refuting something that you didn't have to attend or you shouldn't have attended in the first place. That's not to say that we shouldn't call it out. It's just that there's no need to be melodramatic about it. There's no need to be obtuse or obnoxious about it. The simple lack of your presence is screams loudly anything that you could possibly say if you were to attend and stand up and make a ruckus. So I've changed my mind on that. But yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree there's no scenario in which he told the grandmother the right thing. We'll get into this later on when he doubled down. He talked about giving her advice with a grandfather hat on. In other words, he wasn't thinking pastorally. He was thinking more along the lines of familial and cultural and feelings and wanting to preserve the ties that bind and all these different things. And in that particular scenario, he failed to give her sound biblical counsel. He succeeded in perhaps telling her how to keep them around for a little bit longer, making conversations a little bit easier, avoiding the awkwardness, avoiding the, what you say is the price of following Christ. But he didn't give her biblical sound advice. He gave her very bad advice. And we're going to talk about this later, but I'm not pointing a finger at him and coming down hard on him and saying, Alistair, beg you knucklehead. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that in particular instance, Beg's advice to that grandmother was wrong. And there's just no two ways about it. It was very, very wrong. And if the advice that he gave the grandmother was wrong, then the question is, how should we counsel someone that's in that particular situation? If someone came to me and said, oh, I'll even give a personal example, actually. And I look back on this often. And I wonder, man, what should I have said? I was caught off guard and was not immediately prepared to speak in the time that was allotted me. I was working at a well-known fast food restaurant. It's one of those upper scale fast food restaurants, not like McDonald's or Burger King. It was more like a Panera, Chipotle type fast food chain. And <laughs> the overwhelming majority of the people that worked there were of the homosexual strain. And so one day out of the blue, one of them came to me and put his arm around me and pointed to someone and talked about how he was so attracted to this particular guy, he, this, that, or the other. And I was so shocked by what he was saying to me that I froze. And as soon as he said it, he was off. He went into the kitchen and was doing whatever he was doing. And I completely missed an opportunity to respond there because it happened so quickly. And what do you do when you're in a situation where our entire culture has done a complete 180 on this particular subject, where not even 40, 50 years ago, it was completely unthinkable to celebrate this sort of thing. And now we're at the position where there are laws enshrining this unbiblical lifestyle. How should we counsel someone that is in this grandmother's position. Granted, of course, you and I, were not pastors, obviously, but we may find ourselves in a position as Christians, perhaps talking to someone who is in that situation or who has come to us for counsel. How would you counsel someone in the grandmother's similar situation? Well, I might be a little bit hard-nosed on this one because, as you say, I'm not a pastor. But I think along the line, and this, again, going to be very difficult to hear if you're in this situation. But I think, firstly, I would say, be prepared to suffer the consequences of following Christ. 
I can't stress that enough because in the West, I think we are living such easy lives that when we have a situation to stand on the word of God and to stand and be quote unquote persecuted, we buckle. Yeah. And then we rise up and say, oh yeah, we love God so much. Again, I'm not saying I'm any super Christian or anything. I hope I will stand if the day come for my persecution. I don't know if I would, but to me, be prepared to suffer the consequences mm-hmm. of following Christ. And also understanding loving someone does that mean you upset or condone all their behaviors. I don't know when the definition of love became condone and acceptance. Well, you mentioned it before, how the LGBTQIA community has hijacked language, what it means to love someone, what it means to hate someone, what it means to condemn someone. All of those have different definitions now. Yeah, so I would say, you know, stand on the word of God. Stand on the word of God. You can love your grandchild and still stand on the word of God. You can explain to the grandchild the reason why you can't come. It don't have to be preachy or screaming in their face telling them to repent. But you can clearly tell them, hey, I love you, but I love God more, and I can't. I can't come. And don't give a gift because, again, a wedding is a celebration. So you and a go, gift would be affirming, wouldn't it? Exactly. In, in my affirming. opinion, it would be. Yeah. You know, and I found a quote from Vody Bakum that I wanted to say. And he said, in the West, the devil give us praise, position, and possession. And those things bring us comfort. But what the enemy withholds from us in the West is persecution. And that is what we dread. My question is, what are you willing to give up for the sake of Christ? What are you willing to give up for the sake of Christ? Would that be your grandchild? Hopefully you don't have to give up your grandchild. Episode 51, I think we had Matthew Kashner, how were your barriers removed? Matthew Kashner gave his testimony of being a homosexual and how his parents dealt with him during that time. And if you want the epitome of how you should deal with a loved one who is in a homosexual relationship, LGBTQIA relationship, listen to that episode. I think Matthew Kashner, the parents, handle it perfectly and biblically according to the testimony that he gave. And he was one eventually over because of their strong love for Christ. You know, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 10, again, long passage, but I think it's important. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are of the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man think it, that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, this is Paul speaking, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, prosecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, Doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. The fellowship of his suffering made conformable to his death. Look, I don't want to come across as a super Christian because I'm not. I'm flesh and blood just like everyone else. And I don't know how I would respond if I'm being persecuted for my faith. I probably would recant in whatever the case may be. I don't want to come across as, hey, this guy, so whatever the case may be. But I'm telling you, we live such weak sissified Christian life in the West and in the U.S., that something like this is an issue. It shouldn't be because the Word of God is clear. And I will say, hey, stand upon the Word of God. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it might be alienating. Might be. But stand upon the Word of God. Your love for Christ should appear as hatred for your family. It's hard knows. Some might say it might not even be practical. But show me your practical from the Scripture would be my question. You're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We are talking about Alistair Begg, an LGBT union and dealing with sin. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Jay. 
MCG and I would like for you to help us remove barriers by going to removingbarriers.net and subscribing to receive all things Removing Barriers. If you'd like to take your efforts a bit further and help us keep the mics on, consider donating at removingbarriers.net slash donate. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. Do you have the desire to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Answers in Genesis can help. They provide biblically sound books, CDs, DVDs, homeschooling materials, VBS materials, online courses, digital downloads, and the Answers magazine, and more. Plus, tickets to the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter. Go to the Answers bookstore by clicking the link in the description section below so you too can be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason of the hope that is in you. So now that we're back from the break, let's continue this conversation about dealing with sin. How do we counsel people? How do we deal with the sin itself? How are Christians to deal with sin in unbelievers or as well as in the lives of believers? Because it sounds like this particular grandmother was consistently trying to witness, praying for them, pointing out their lifestyles as being in opposition to Christ and his word. So if you have someone, whether saved or unsaved, and I realize that addressing their sin will follow different stripes, but how should we be addressing sin in the lives of people? Well, firstly, I would say, I'll shoot it over to you, get your opinion as well. But firstly, I would say, if you're dealing with sin in the life of the unbeliever, I think you come down to one thing. You present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. I don't think you need to go to them and point every little thing that they're doing and this lifestyle is wrong, that lifestyle is wrong. You present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit convict them of sin and judgment to come and pray that they will be saved. That's how you deal with sin with unbelievers. The dynamics are a little bit different if you're living with an unsafe person, like for instance, or if you're a family member, because you don't want to be obnoxious and every day you see the person, you tell them, you know, I need to tell you, you need to be repent and get saved and stuff like that. I don't think you need to be in their face like that. If you're living with them, of course, if the opportunity to present yourself, you want to present the gospel. But what is more important when you're living with an unsafe person is your testimony mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ in your life, more so than constantly verbally witnessing to them. That's different than if you go into a stranger's door and knocking on the door and trying to present the gospel to them. Because that person doesn't know you, they don't know your lifestyle. But if you're in a situation where you're living and interacting with a person every day, your lifestyle become even more important there than even your verbal testimony. And I think that is biblical principle. As I talk about the unsaved wife, the Bible talking, she will win him by her conversation, conversation. or by her by testimony. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to unsaved person, I think you present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the saved person, well, the Bible gives us guidance on how to deal with these things. Of course, in the terms of offense, the Bible says in Matthew 18, 15 to 7, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So here the goal is to restore fellowship, is to restore the brother through confession and sin and forsaking them. In Proverbs 28 and verse 13, the Bible says, He that covered his sin shall not prosper, or who have confessed and forsaken them shall have mercy. So the important thing here is, in all of this, the Bible says, alone first, then between two or three witnesses, and if then the person does not continue, does not confess and forsake or repent, take it before the church we, of course, become a church issue before the pastor and the deacons for church discipline. So I think that's, I guess, how we deal with believers when it comes to sin and stuff like that. The Bible make it clear, alone first, they're still not repenting. Get two or three witnesses, they're still not repenting before the church. And if after the church, the Bible says, hey, treat them like a heathen. I'm not quite sure I've ever seen it done that someone actually got treated like a heathen. But <laughs> I think the Bible is clear on the process of restoring a brother who is in sin. 
I wonder if that speaks to the weakening of our churches and that we haven't seen church discipline carried out as it's described here in Matthew 18. We hardly get to know each other as church members well enough for this to actually take place. Perhaps in the church there seems to be this sort of, well, you know, non-judgmental sort of, well, you know, let's not talk about these things. That's, I don't want to say it's sweeping it under the rug, but maybe there's a hesitance to effectively deal with these things, perhaps not in every church and not in every gathering, but I mean in the church as a whole. If you don't see it done often, then that's indicative of the weakness of the church. It doesn't have teeth to go after sin in that particular way. And I'm sure that's another whole can of worms yeah, to open I, up. I think the principle here is that private sin should be dealt with privately. Public sin should be dealt with publicly. Again, I'm coming from an island perspective and also the U.S. perspective. What I see how church discipline is carried out in the islands is a little bit different than up here. And again, the cultures are different, so it's not a fair comparison. And again, everybody in the islands kind of know everybody, especially in a small island like where I'm from. You know, if it was a big island like Jamaica, maybe not. But in the small islands that where I'm from, if someone is in public sin, Everybody kind of know. Mm -hmm. Let's make it a really bad thing, quote unquote. Let's say it's a, a man professing to be a Christian, active in the church, church member, but then he's sleeping with his girlfriend or whatever. It's not going to be long before people in this village know, it comes back to the church, and a bunch of people know. So the pastor has to execute discipline, say, in a, somewhat of a public way, mm -hmm. in terms of, of a process he might go through. I'm not saying he's going to get a whooping or something, but public way. Up here, what I've noticed is most of the time, the people just leave the church and move on. They move to a different church. Or it is done very privately. Like I remember that growing up, the pastor would have a meeting. I'm talking when I kind of come to age as a member and can attend those meetings. The pastor, I remember the pastor many times will have the members stay back after service or call a special business meeting or whatever, and discuss and say, hey, brother so such such or sister such and such was, you know, falling in the sin, whatever the case may be, and going to be on the church discipline. He would not say that on a Sunday morning with non-members and stuff like that. But everybody kind of know because of the size of the country or the island. But I've never seen that done up here. I've never gone to a business meeting or whatever, and the pastor kind of blatantly say, hey, this person has fallen in the sin. And they're going to be on the church discipline. Depends on the position of the person. They might make an announcement to the members that the person, you know, fallen sin would never say what the sin is. And maybe kind of say, hey, this is what we're going to do. But you never hear anything else about it kind of thing. Or if it's private, you never hear anything about it completely. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. I'm just saying that I think culturally there's a difference. Because, for instance, I can get up and, you know, let's say I fall in sin. I can drive 500 miles north, south, or whatever, and go to another church. No one knows me. No one knows anything. Kind of move on. You can't do that in the island. For one, the most you can drive is probably 10 miles. <laughs> and then you go to someplace else, and everybody knows you over there. So, yeah, hey, yeah, that's the person who, he just left that church, and he came over here because he wants. You can't do that. Yeah. Everybody knows the baggage you're bringing here. No one knows the baggage you're bringing when you move, you know, 1,200 miles from where you live into another state. So it's a little bit different. but. I think the Bible principle really means the same. Well, okay, that's interesting because this entire scenario is different as well because this all happened online. And that's a dynamic I think that we need to address because when he talked about this grandmother and things began piling on in late January, February of 2024, you had pretty much every Christian YouTuber, whether they are pastor or layman or just Christian content creators on YouTube piling on, talking about what he said. Why is it wrong? Why is it right? Like the conversation was intense surrounding this particular issue. And so this was done publicly. It was done on the interwebs, on the internet for everyone to see and for everyone to hear. And so everyone on the internet jumped on it. And that is something that we need to evaluate as Christians. Is that the biblical response? Because the Bible says, go to the person one-on-one. -on -one. If they won't hear you, take two or three. Address the person again. If they won't hear the two or three, take it to the church. 
And if he's not listening to the church, treat him as an unbeliever. And so the internet has changed that dynamic. Someone can say something, say online or on a podcast, in an interview, whatever, and everyone is jumping on this one person. It can be incredibly overwhelming to respond to something so drastic. Maybe that's why he felt the need to respond like he did. Because if you have like a thousand people pointing at this one thing, this one thing, this one thing, and all it takes is just one person, and you're bombarded by all of this negativity, perhaps that shines a light on how we as Christians are responding to sin in this new social media digital age that we're living in now as well. I agree that the internet does add a different dynamic to this. It amplifies things where... Sure, if it wasn't for the internet and advancement of this, let's say it was back when we just had cable TV and radio, so to speak. And even if he had said this on the radio, we wouldn't have a platform to respond to it here because we're podcast. But I think also this is where the local body kind of come into play Mm -hmm. because I don't necessarily think that it's my job to get a hold of Alistair Begg and say, hey, you know, that advice wasn't the best advice. Because one, I'm not a part of his local body and he doesn't know me from Adam, so to speak. So I think if anyone in his congregation believed that he had sin or believed that advice was wrong, they should not first turn to YouTube and podcasts to say, my pastor said this and it was wrong. I'm going to condemn it here over the stuff. They should have gone to Alistair and said, hey, pastor, I love you. I think that advice was, and I'm sure there are people in this congregation, I can't imagine there's no one in the congregation who doesn't believe that the advice was poor. Well, I'm sure there's a handful, but according to him, everyone on his pastoral staff thinks that he gave good counsel, and he explicitly said that his friends and family are shielding him, or at least were shielding him, from the onslaught of criticism that he received online. Internet can be brutal. Yeah, right. But what he said that was worrying was that Everyone on his pastoral team said that he did the right thing in giving that grandmother the advice. Now that's... Well, that's coming from him. Mm. And again, I don't know anybody in this church and knowing anything about it. So he could be right. Unfortunately, again, I don't know these people, but they could just be, yes, man. Yes, I don't believe you stuff because... Or he could be exaggerating. Yeah. All the bread and butter comes from him. So, you know, I'm not going to condemn the man who is basically paying my salary kind of thing. So again, I don't know. To be honest... I had never heard of Alistair Begg until this happened. Never. I've heard of <laughs> wow. John MacArthur. Yeah. I've heard of Vody Backham, some other preachers out there, but I've never heard of him before That's this happened. That's amazing to think about. So, He's actually one of my favorite preachers to listen to. So. so to say that, because this happened, I heard of him and heard of him in this light. No, we are all fallible men. I'm sure if you go through all 160 whatever plus episode we have done. Sure. I'm sure there are things that I say that people say, oh, yeah, MCG, that's totally wrong. Yeah. You're following me. And again, I wouldn't put him in the bracket of T.D. Jakes and no, no. Joel Estina, stuff like that. Say, oh, no, he's a false preacher or whatever the case may be. I think he was wrong here, but I don't think this is necessarily make him like, look at that false prophet or whatever. Or heretic. Term, or heretic or whatever. Right. I think he's a follower man just like all of us. Sure. He gave bad advice, in my opinion, and I think scripture is on my side. And again, at the end of the day, you move on. But again, I think he was wrong. I don't want to be hard on him because again, I don't know the man. I've even heard of him before that. But at the end of the day, hey, I don't think going to LGBTQIA unions is the best move. Yeah. So in response to the backlash, Alistair Begg doubled down He said he refused to recant, he refused to repent, and he said a lot of other things as well. And so I'd like for us to listen to some of the clips in which he addresses what he calls the storm in the teacup. In other words, everyone's making a big deal out of nothing, is what he's saying. It's a storm in a teacup. Now, there are certain things that he said in response to the backlash, and to me, these things are very, very concerning. And of course, I'm a nobody. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a regular Jane. But his response is a little bit concerning. But I also wonder if he responded in that way because of the amplification of the response on 
I think it was just pride. Internet. I think it's absolutely that as well. But I want to be as generous as possible because I know that he's a faithful preacher of the Word of God. And so let me just pull up these two clips. But just by way of quick summary, he not only refused to repent, he claimed that he didn't have to and that everyone accusing him of giving the grandmother wrong advice is pharisaical in their position. And he also preached a sermon in which he pulled up Luke 13, Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son, and comparing the people who were calling out the issue as the older brother and accusing them of lacking compassion and all of these different things. He talked about how he doesn't identify with American fundamentalism or evangelicalism, and he insults them as being incapable of determining nuance in situations and being too hard-lined about things. And so there are a lot of things in his response that are worrying. I'll play a few clips here. Here's the first clip. In that conversation with that grandmother, I was concerned about the well-being of their relationship more than anything else, hence my counsel. Don't misunderstand that in any way at all. If I was in the receiving end of another question about another situation from another person in another time, I may answer absolutely differently. But in that case, I answered in that way, and I would not answer in any other way, no matter what anybody says on the Internet as of the last 10 days. If that were the case, I would never... If that were the case, I, would never, I should never have said it in the first place. If people want to, me to recant and to repent. To repent? I, I, I repent daily because I say a lot of things that I shouldn't say. I mean, check with Sue, but the fact of the matter is I'm not ready to repent over this. I don't have to. Okay, so that's the first part of his response. And to me, that's problematic. I'd like to hear what you think, MCG, because he said, above all else, he was concerned about preserving the relationship between the grandmother and her grandchild. Above all else above what thus saith the Lord, above what Scripture has clearly delineated as sin, as proper conduct for Christians, above all else. Your thoughts? I think my thoughts is clear based on what I said earlier. Yeah. What are you willing to give up for the cause of Christ? Above all else? Again, if you say, hey, MCG, you're very hard-nosed in this episode, and I will agree. I come across a very hard nose. I may come across maybe as unloving in terms of my tone. But I do understand the relationship. I do understand that the grandmother doesn't want to lose fellowship with her grandchild. However, again, I ask, what are you willing to give up for the cause of Christ above all else? It goes back to what Pastor Todd said. Love, my friend, does not win. True twins. Yeah, and of course, cool. the Bible says that can be full of grace and truth. And we have to have a balance. He was perfectly balanced with grace and truth. We have to have that balance. But at the same time, we don't celebrate what God condemns. So while I can be compassionate, there's a common point where you have to say, hey, no, because I can take it so far. If someone, I hate to use this illustration, so forgive me. Mm -hmm. But if someone comes and says, hey, be compassionate with me, allow me to have your way with my wife out of compassion. Do I do that because I want to be compassionate? Compassion has to end where sin begins. And to me, you're simply saying it's okay to sin because you're being compassionate. And to me, again, that's wrong. Yeah, I think if we were to fill in the blank with any other sin that this grandmother is dealing with, let's say that your child is abusing drugs and you want to be compassionate. The child comes to you, asks for money because they need a fix. You want to be compassionate. You want to reach out. And you don't want to make them angry and close the door for fellowship between them. Do you give them the money to go and pursue that fix, that drug? Because it's compassion. You want to preserve that relationship above all else. Of course not. Vody Balkov talked about this before. He talked about how where we talked about LGBTQ, when we're talking about LGBTQIA situations, even in the pulpit, before they talk about it, There's all of these disclaimers and all of these caveats and all of these apologies and all of these. You have to set it up and say, well, I love gay people and I don't hate gay people and I'm not against you and I'm not this or that. And you have all these qualifiers before you get to what thus saith the Lord. Right. We've become uh, what is it called when like you take the edge off the teeth weak. Yeah. You're de-weaponized. 
de-weaponize is not the right word, but when it comes to addressing sin, we're afraid to. And that's a problem in this particular instance. Alistair Begg almost spits out the word repent as though that were some dirty word that doesn't apply to him, as though he doesn't need to. He's never had to. Well, I know he says he repents daily, but in this particular instance, where there's such a clear line in the sand about what good counsel is, he almost spits out the word incredulous. Repent? Repent for what? That I find a little bit troubling. It does come across as pride to me. Prideful, yes. He continues here. Now, let me say something that will be a little explosive. <laughs> and notice how his congregation, there doesn't seem to be any pushback there. There just seems to be full support. But anyway, I digress. Here he continues. <laughs> I've lived here for 40 years, and those who know me best know that when we talk theology, when we talk stuff, I, I've always said I am a little bit out of sync with the American evangelical world. For this reason, that I am the product of British evangelicalism, represented by John Stott, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Eric Alexander, Sinclair Ferguson, Derek Prime. I am a product of that. I have never been a product of American fundamentalism. I come from a world in which it is possible for people to actually grasp the fact that there are nuances in things. Those of you who are lawyers understand this. Everything is not so categorically clear that if you put one foot out of this box, you got to be removed from the box forever. Okay, so notice the insult there to anyone that is fundamentalist in their views and they're holding to Scripture. To say that it's wrong to give that grandmother that advice, you're fundamentalist and you are incapable of grasping the nuance, he says in these different things, because he comes from British evangelicalism. So number one, there is a, I don't want to call it a sowing discord, but there is this idea that British evangelicalism is somehow superior or better or more nuanced or more sophisticated than American fundamentalism. And if you disagree with him, you're an American. Am I taking that too far? That seems to be what I heard. Well, what I heard initially was that he's pulling his resume. Yes. So here's my I'm resume. I'm associated with these great theologians. That's where I come from. And you kind of go back to that scripture I just read with Paul, yeah. where Paul mentioned basically his resume. And he said, he count them but dung. Alistair, yeah, are you, them but dung. Are yeah, you that's counting, great. That's are you really counting good. all those things but dung? Really good, really good. But at the same time, when it comes to American evangelicalism, I can understand that. I'm not the product of American evangelicalism. Sure. I'm from the islands in the Caribbean. Yeah. We kind of do things a little bit differently. So I can't understand where you're coming from. And I'm from the islands. We do nuance there, Alistair. And I'm saying you're wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what, what's your point of going back to England? Okay, I'm going back to the Caribbean. I still think you're wrong. Sorry, the way you said that was pretty funny. But, but this is no laughing matter. Yeah. But at the end of the day, hey, I gotta say, I don't think that put him in the bracket of a heresy or heretic or a false yeah. teacher or whatever the case may be. It's pride. I, it, it's basically pride at this point. And whatever the case may be, I think this is a public issue. And I think you should have at least say, you know what, make it clear. And I'm not saying he stands with the LGBTQIA community or anything like that. But at least you can say, hey, you know what, maybe the advice wasn't the best advice. You know what? I would have still encouraged her to go, but maybe the advice wasn't the best advice. And at the end of the day, you know what? You should not have even made this public. Yeah. You should have known that the world that you inhabit, the people that listen to you, outside of how many hundred people that go to your church, the rest of the world listening to you go to say, hey, you know what? There's some things they just don't put on the internet. I have a podcast. There's some things I don't put on the internet because, you know what? Hey, and I don't have the size of audience that you have. So... And his reach is massive. He's on radio stations all throughout the country. In fact, as a result of having doubled down on this American, I think it's called American Family Radio, the AFR, took down all of his time slots. You know how radio stations have time right. slots for different ministries. They completely took him out. And, and he was disinvited from some conference yes, the, John MacArthur was having. He was disinvited from Shepherd's Conference as well. So there's another section in his response that I think is interesting and telling telling in the sense that two things. Number one, we should be praying for Alistair that the Lord would 
open his eyes to the pride that we are all susceptible to, that we are all vulnerable to, that we are all victims of and partake in sinfully, praying for him, but also watching lest we fall as well. Just being mindful of the different ways in which we're being prideful, the different ways in which we fall, particularly when we're confronted with sin. That's a very difficult thing. Again, for our listeners, I hope that you can sense that we're not coming across as bashing Alistair Begg. He has been a faithful preacher of God's Word for many, many, many years. So this is not us bashing him. This is just addressing an issue that I think that the church is waffling on, that the church is not standing firm on, this LGBTQIA virus that persists, that we seem to be hesitant to confront head on. So here's Alistair Begg uh, continuing toward the end of his response with more of doubling down that is particularly concerning to me, MCG. We'd love to hear what you think about this. Monogamous relationship between one man and one woman for life. Amen. And at that, they stood up and walked out. Well, why didn't somebody catch that one for me? You know what? I'm glad they didn't. And I'll tell you why. Because if I've got to go down on the side of one or the other, I'll go down on this side. I'll go down on the side of compassion with people actually accusing me of just weakness rather than go down on the side of condemnation, which closes any doors of opportunity for future engagement with those who know exactly what we believe about the Bible and about Jesus and about so on. So, Uh, You know, I I hope that this is helpful. I I think as long as you understand that my response to one grandmother whom I have never met um, was not in any way a blanket recommendation to all Christians to attend LGBTQ weddings. It was nothing to do with that at all. Uh, If I was misguided in any way, it was I allowed my grandfatherly hat to uh, take over. It was my personal opinion as I sensed what was best as I learned about the individual and specific situation. All right. So in that particular instance, before that clip, he was saying that he didn't understand why people were coming down so hard on him because before when he was talking to a group in California somewhere and he was expressing And putting his foot down on the biblical definition of marriage being between one man and one woman, many people in the audience got up and left because they were an LGBTQ supporting group. And he wondered, well, why didn't anyone talk about that? The reason why is, I think, is because you were preaching what thus saith the Lord. What is there to say? You were saying what the Bible says. You were in agreement with the scriptures. And those who were not got up and left. There's nothing noteworthy or there's no responding to that that needs to happen. In this particular instance, you gave, again, we're beating a dead horse, you gave terrible counsel to someone who came to you for biblical counsel, and now everyone's calling you out on it, and it's apparently an issue. The people who are calling you out are pharisaical and not nuanced enough and not of the right theological stock. That's the issue there. And again, he mentioned that he was responding to a woman that he had never met and thinking of it in terms of a grandfather wanting to preserve that relationship. And like he said at the first clip, above all else. And that's the issue. Alistair Begg should know, and all of us should know, that when you have a platform like his, you influence a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Impact of the words you say and the things you do cannot be underestimated. And there are people who are looking to you to help them understand what the scriptures say about a particular issue. And if you say something like this, naturally, they're going to think that Alistair Begg is okay with Christians attending LGBTQIA weddings. There's no other way to interpret that. Why else would you even make that public if that's not where you stood? I should be careful. I don't want to come across as accusing him of being okay with LGBTQIA weddings because I know he's not. But to put that out there is to, in some way or another, endorse or support or deem okay to go to LGBTQIA weddings. Your thoughts, MCG? Well, I think that he was telling the truth in that last clip. Telling the truth in what way? In terms of, I think he was taking it in isolation. Mm-hmm. Hey, this grandma have a unique situation. This is my advice to this person. Mm-hmm. And my advice to someone else, when the nuances are different, will be different. The problem is your followers, quote unquote, would not see it that way. There's going to be someone out there who says, well, Alistair Begg says that it's okay for me to go to my relatives who are gay weddings, quote unquote, and take them a gift. 
that's what they're going to hear. Mm -hmm. So even though I think the advice is wrong, I think the bigger problem is that you make it public. Because even if I agree that there might be some situation where you might possibly go, you don't make that kind of thing public. Because your pastor, the flock is going to take it in generality. Oh, so I can go to my son's wedding, even though he's married to another man. That's where the problem lies. Again, I think I'm taking a little bit of hard nose on it. I think you should not go. I think it's the most loving thing you can do is not going and standing up a word of God and show your love for Christ. And I agree, reasonable minds can differ, but I think that's the problem there. You made it public, more so than even the advice itself. And so the backlash is going to be public. And now in this social media age, the backlash is going to be immediate and it's going to be amplified, of course. So what I found problematic is the accusing your brothers of being Pharisees. I find that really a problem, a problem of wearing that grandfather hat, caring about the relationship above all else. That really is problematic, saying that you don't have to repent and that somehow because you come from different theological stock, as he said, that somehow there's an issue with fundamentalism. If you hold to the basic tenets and the truths of God's word, that somehow that you're in the wrong for that. Those are all very problematic responses to this situation. And so my prayer for Alistair Begg and for all of us when we're confronted with our sin is that we would repent. Absolutely. There are others that are calling for him to come under church discipline. I know the BTWN guy is calling for that. But yeah, definitely the responses are problematic. And we should be praying for our pastors wholesale anyway. They are a prime target. The enemy knows that if he can take down the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And so there's definitely a lot to pray for in this particular situation. So obviously the response to Alistair Beck has been intense, but he (laughs) dismisses it as a storm in the teacup. And for the most part, it seems that as of this recording, many folks have moved on, but it it still hasn't been resolved. Now, his contemporaries, they're no paperweights. We're talking people like John MacArthur's, the John Piper's, the Vody Bauckham's of the world. What do they have to say about this? Well, I have some clips of some pastors, John MacArthur, Vody Bauckham, that either said something about it. Not all of them are in response to him, but what they had to say. But I want to read an article here before I play those clips. The title of the article is, Does Alistair Begg Have a Point About Gay Weddings? I'm just going to read some of it. I'm going to read all of it pretty long. A contentious debate among believers was reignited last week, and this was written back in January. The firestorm erupted after advice from pastor and Bible teacher Alistair Begg surfaced where Beg advised a grandmother that she should attend her grandchild's wedding to a transgender individual and to bring a gift. So I'm going to skip down a little bit. He said, I'm not surprised by the opposition he has received. This is a painful, familiar issue for me. Over a decade ago, my identical twin brother married another man. After much wrestling and prayer, my wife and I decided to attend the wedding. I'm going to skip down a little bit again. He said, when my wife and I decided to attend my brother's wedding, we do so knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that he and his partner had no question where we stood. Yeah, he and his partner may not have a question where you stood, but what about everyone else? What about all the Christians that are going to be? Anyways, I go on. <laughs> where we stood biblically and relationally. If we were not confident of this, we would have felt guilty of passive approval. My brother was in a relationship with his partner for several years before they marry. Over those years, we had very direct and honest conversation. Again, call it, it's not a marriage. They didn't get married. All right, I'm going to skip down a little bit. My brother and I even had a heated discussion the day before the wedding. There would be no way to mistake our motives. I was abundantly clear that we were not celebrating or endorsing their choice. In fact, the first word out of the officiant at the ceremony were, now we know that there are some here that disagree with this union, but they have chosen to be here because they love them. For that, we thank you. You attended the ceremony as a demonstration that no matter what choices they made, we love them. I think there's other ways he can show love. Anyway, I believe that the practical logical fallacy is driving many of the responses of Beck's advice and to this conflicted grandmother and has been at the heart of the debate since we had to face this reality almost 14 years ago. I call false equivalency fallacy. A false equivalency is an informal fallacy in which equivalent is drawn between two subjects based on flawed or false reasoning. The flawed reasoning here is that presence and celebration are the same thing. If you're present, you are by default celebrating. I think the false equivalency is on your part because you're going to a celebration, but saying you're not celebrating. (laughs) A wedding is a celebration. And you're going to the celebration, 
but you're going just to be present, but you're not celebrating. So again, remove this. What else can I say? Can I go to a strip joint and tell my wife, well, I was just present. No. What other sin do we condone in this way, calling it presence and celebration? Mm. No. What other evil do we condone and put presence and celebration in a different bracket? You're going to a celebration. Whether or not you're happy and joyful or you're just sitting down and not clapping, you're at the celebration. Anyways, he said, I'm currently deep in my 40s. And over the years, I have known many parents who not only attend, but in many cases, even funded the heterosexual wedding ceremonies of their children who were marrying partners they would not have chosen. Many of these parents were extremely grieved by the union. Again, who's not the same thing. Who's using false equivalency? Yeah, not the same thing at all. They go into a heterosexual wedding ceremony and the parents disagree. Yeah. Now, I do believe that children should follow their parents' advice on their partners. In the West, we don't have parents necessarily choosing the partner for the child. It's great to get the blessing of your parent, and I think children should seek that. But I don't think the Bible says that thou shall marry the person your parent asked you to marry, or the parents set you up with, or whatever the case may be. But the Bible makes it clear that you should not marry someone of the same sex. The Bible makes it clear that you should marry the unsafe person. So if two Christians are getting married with the parents that agree with the marriage, yeah, you might say, you know what, it's not the best way to show honor for your parents. But if they're both adults, it's not the same thing. You're talking about false equivalency. It's literature throughout this article of yeah. your false equivalency. Yeah. Anyways, I'm going to leave it there because he went on to talk about God being present at every gay wedding and difference between his God manifested presence and his omnipresence and all this stuff, which, of course, we know God is omnipresent, so God is present there. But when we're talking about God being present, we're more talking about of the moving of the Holy Ghost, the manifested presence, as you call it. So I, I think that's important because this guy, and I didn't check the person who wrote this article, but those are some of the people that come into the defense of Alistair Begg. And I'm like, if that's the strongest argument that presence of the equal celebration, there's a lot of problem there with this. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. What are we willing to give up with Christ? Are we willing to suffer loss? Anyways, you talk about the contemporaries. I'm going to start with John MacArthur because someone asked John MacArthur this direct question about Alistair Begg, and here what he has to say. Good evening, Pastor John. This, my name's Neil MacLeod. I'm yes. a Scot. Yes. <laughs> They're not going to get rid of us. <laughs> John, I, ha- I have a question that's been heavy on my heart about one of our Scottish brothers. Will you comment and guide us as to why Alistair Beck is mistaken in advising a member of his, of his flock to attend and solemnize a marriage of her granddaughter to a transgender partner? Can you guide us as to why we should not bend to do this? Yeah, that, that question Thank you. came up and has gotten all over the Internet. Let me say, first of all, that Alistair and I have been friends for, well, 45 years. Uh, When I was in Scotland 45 years ago, I was pushing his 45-year-old son in a pram. You know what a pram is, Neil. It's like a baby buggy. So we've had a lot of history together. And I have a great affection for him. Um, I also want to say that you shouldn't judge a man by his weakest moment. Um... All of us will have a a moment of weakness. Having said that, uh, I have to disagree with the answer that he gave to the question. A believer should not go to a homosexual transgender wedding for, for a lot of reasons. But he was making the argument that you go out of compassion rather than condemnation. You, you go to show love to them as a means to reach them. My my response to that is the most loving thing you could possibly do would be not to go and to condemn the relationship. That is loving. It's not loving to help somebody celebrate stepping into the fury of God's judgment. No, no transgender person effeminate homosexual will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is not a time for you to celebrate thinking that your affection for somebody is the means of their salvation. They they will come to salvation when the Lord 
exposes their sin. That's why the Holy Spirit, John 16, convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. And what should be said to somebody is this is wrong, this is against God's order, this is not marriage. It is not a marriage because you can't have a marriage between two people of the same sex. It's not a marriage at all. It is defying God who ordained marriage and ordained male and female and designed procreation. It is a blasphemy against God, as is transgender life and homosexuality as well. That is the message to give in love. I, um, I, I couldn't, beyond the theological reasons and the biblical reasons, I couldn't affirm that. If, if I went, I would affirm that. Not only could I not affirm it, I, I don't think I could tolerate it. I don't think I could survive sitting in something like that and feeling like I was supportive of it. And then to give them a gift, I, that, that is to aid and abet the celebration of something that is defying God's design. And the very, very, I would say, point of the spear currently of the corruption of this entire culture. So you can't be a part of that. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. I do say this. I don't understand why you would answer the question that way. I thought if, if somebody was in that situation and had that view, and you're on the radio and somebody says, and this, you're recording this, right? So you're, whoever your host is is going to ask you a question, and the host says, uh, what would you tell this grandma about going to a transgender wedding? I would immediately say, ask me another question. Particularly if I, if I was at all prone to suggest that that might be okay, I would never say that because you have to calculate the cost of that. And wh- how do you calculate that? I mean, the, the price for that is, is really epic. It's, it's really epic. And there's so much more about him that is wonderful and and faithful in his ministry, just past 40 years of pastoral ministry in that church. And it was a great celebration. And now he's going to be defined by that. Uh, that, that I don't know how you calculate doing that for that reason, um, unless there is some very personal relationship with someone you're trying to win over or protect. But that's really speculation in my mind. And that was Pastor John MacArthur. Here is Pastor Vody Bakum. Neutrality is not an option. And, and so many Christians are under the deluded impression that if we just keep our head down, if we just go to church, if we just practice our faith in our home, if we, if we, if we just do that, that, that they'll leave us alone. But they won't. They won't. I, I don't know if you've been watching lately, but it's not enough for you to just refuse to be hostile. It is now demanded that you bend the knee and confess Caesar is Lord. You can't be neutral. Try to be neutral if you want to. We're just going to be neutral. We're just going to go about our lives. Yep. And then your daughter lines up in the track meet and there's a boy racing her. What do you do? Do you sit there, take the loss, 
clap when the trophy is given to the biological male? What do you do? What do you do when you go to work? And, and, and then they, they have this new policy at your work where you put your pronouns on everything. And you say, no, no, I'm not going to play the game. I'm just not going to put the pronouns on there. And they say, no, 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 it's a policy. Put your pronouns on there. Fine. I'll put my pronouns on there. But my pronouns are the pronouns that God gave me. Good for you. Because that's just step one. You've put your pronouns. Everybody else has put their pronouns. And then this is what happens. They come to you and they say, you must bear false witness. Look at that man and call him a woman. Neutrality is not an option. Go get your PhD. Go be the best student ever, anywhere. Go try to write a grant proposal. Try to be a scientist, a biologist, a, a, a chemistry, anybody. Try, try, just, just, just try today to go and do that. And sidestep all the minds, all of them, that say your work must be based on the assumption that there is no God, that the world was not created, and that it's billions and billions and billions of years old. Neutrality is not an option. Try as you might. And it always boggles my mind, right? You can have one person who says the world is 30 billion years old. Great. You get a prize. And another person who comes and says, no, actually, the world is more than 60 billion years old. No problem. You get a prize too. I come... And I say, the world is actually several thousand years old. And they say, you're an idiot. Why? Why? The distance between the 60 billion year guy and the 30 billion year guy is 30 billion years. The distance between the 30 billion guy and me is less than 30 billion years. How come both of them get to be okay, but I don't? Neutrality is not an option, folks. When our children go to schools that pump this stuff into them, neutrality is not an option. In your family, some of you have experienced this. In your own family, neutrality is not an option. All the recent stir about, you know, do you go to, 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 to the, the gay wedding? Do you not go to the gay wedding? All of this recent stir. Why? Why are Christians wanting their pastors and leaders to help them think through this? I'll tell you why. Because when the family or the extended family comes to you and says, Johnny's marrying another man, they know that you're a Christian. They're just double dog daring you to say that there's something wrong with it and you're not going. Neutrality is not an option. It's not. By the way, why is neutrality not an option? I'm glad you asked. Because these worldviews are rooted and grounded in atheism. They're rooted and grounded in the idea that there is no God. And because there is no God, we are accountable to no one, to nothing except ourselves. That's why we use phrases like, my truth. We're accountable to no one. If there is a God, all of these worldviews fall. So you cannot go around proclaiming your worldview 
that is rooted and grounded in the existence of the one true and living God, the God who was and who is and who is to come, without there being this clash. So neutrality is not an option. I'm sorry. If you thought you could get out of this unscathed, I'm here to tell you tonight, you cannot and you will not. And I will end with this one, Dr. Stephen Lawson. I'm not quite familiar with Dr. Stephen Lawson, but he had some interesting things to say about this. There's been a lot of talk recently about whether a Christian should attend a homosexual marriage. And there's been a lot of talk recently about whether a Christian should attend a transgender wedding. And should they bring a gift to the wedding so that they would appear to be compassionate and loving? And I want you to know that the answer is absolutely no. You have no business being there. Because it is a travesty, it is a blasphemy, it is an abomination, it is not to be supported, it is not to be celebrated, it is to be repudiated, and it is to be exposed. And by attending, you are celebrating this union. And you cannot celebrate blatant, gross sin of the highest order. Adrian Rogers said years ago, and it needs to be heard again today, he's with the Lord now, it is better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than to speak falsehood that comforts, but then kills. It is not love and it is not friendship if we fail to declare the whole counsel of God. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. It is better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with the multitude. Let us not forget that marriage is not the product of culture or society. It is not the result of man's thinking. That it is God and God alone in His infinite wisdom who has designed marriage, and there is the sanctity of marriage entering into a holy union. And those who are unholy are to be reproved for entering into that which God has made holy. And so by even attending, much less even bringing a gift, you are giving your endorsement of approval of what is taking place. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you have made it this far into this episode, thank you for listening. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. If the podcast or the blog were a blessing to you, leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us, to support this podcast, or to learn more about Removing Barriers, go to removingbarriers.net. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.